All right, so those of you that have questions, um, you should have been given um, an index card when you came in. If you don't have an index card, we have a stack over there um, at the podium, um, I guess, bare um, railing. But um, please write them down. We have volunteers that are going to collect them. And we're going to ask Dr. Michael Brown your questions. Um, we hope that they're thoughtful. We hope that they're provoking. Ask your tough questions. This is, this is a time, and he will um, address it as much as he can. Great, thanks. Yeah, yeah and let me just say this. The, the questions don't have to be politely worded. You know, if, if, you, if you're upset and you want to raise an upset question, that's perfectly fine. Uh, I, I do hope that there'll be wonderful opportunity for exchange and other viewpoints at the so-called Apartheid Week events. And again, uh, I have not given the whole story of everything. You can't do it in a, however long I talked in one hour lecture, but I want to assure you as best as possible, I gave you a truthful narrative and truthful representation. And wherever I could, sought to balance things, but I'm also doing my best to say there's a whole lot that is not being told. There's a whole lot of demonizing of Israel that is going on. All right, so I'm still waiting for the questions. For those that came in a little later, just wanted to mention that about the amount of folks we have here was pretty much what I was expecting, and I thought we'd be in a room that seated, you know, 50, 100 people and, and interact in that particular way. Uh, this hall was booked in anticipation of someone being willing to have a public dialogue debate with me, which was my hope so that we could, we could get both sides aired and together and you could hear them side by side. But that not happening, here we are in this wonderful facility and get to have this big screen presentation. Let's, let's give our appreciation to our audio and video folks there for, for doing a good job. Oh, also, let me invite you to call my radio program if you want to interact verbally instead of in writing. Uh, I'm on two hours a day live nationally, but in the Tampa area, I'm on from three to four in the afternoon. You get my second hour from three to four in the afternoon on WTBN. So what are the call letters of that? Anyone know? 570 AM or FM? 570 AM, three to four in the afternoon. I cover lots of different subjects, but if you call in and say you were, you were at the lecture and you wanted to raise an issue or you had a question, I'll do my best to, to squeeze that in or to set up a time when we, we can talk on the air. All right, so we're, we got some questions here. Okay. All right, and more to come. Uh, do you feel as though your presentation was focused on extremists? Um, no, but it's a great question. Let me say that I, I constantly made reference to extremists. And, and if you remember when I was talking about Haj Amin al-Husseini, and even some of the quotes from Ephraim Karsh, the bulk of the people were not coming from an extremist position. There were extremist factions, and that drove the war, that drove the conflict. Rather than the peace-loving larger percentage of the population dictating what happened, it was extremist elements that drove things. The sad thing is, the extremist mentality is quite pervasive throughout the whole now. In other words, what would have been considered a much more extreme position years ago is much more the norm. And with the constant demonizing of Israel, and every day that there is suffering in Gaza, or every day that there's suffering in the West Bank, or a water shortage, or a power outage, or something, Israel becomes more and more the demonic, terrible force in the eyes of the people as a whole. Hence it becomes much bigger than just the extremists. I've heard that the Jews in Israel are Ashkenazi uh, and not the original Jews that were there. You've heard that because that's one of the rumors that circulates that the Jews were not actually Jews. In, in point of fact, DNA studies will connect Ashkenazi Jews with ancient Israelites. For example, those who are descendants of Aaron the high priest, and, and who would have the last name Cohen in many cases or something related to that. Uh, DNA unites them together. Now, something fascinating is that there, there is some speculation. There is some speculation that some of those who identify as Palestinian are actually ancient Israelites, which really makes things interesting. And they have, they have been a presence there for uh, a couple thousand years. 
but as far as I, you have different, Jews have been all over the world. So you have Sephardi and Ashkenazi. So Ashkenazi, primarily from, from Eastern Europe, Sephardic Jews, Northern Africa, Spain, Middle East. Uh, you know what's interesting? Is that my cell phone just went off. After I looked at it before we started, I apologize for hanging up on my daughter. Uh, but after I looked at it before we started and, and wanted to remind everyone to turn their cell phones off, and I looked at mine to make sure it was off, and, and something happened. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, yeah, th there's another myth that today's Jews are not really Jews, that they are descendants of, of the Khazar Empire, that the, the, the people of Khazar converted in mass into Judaism, and that makes up Jews today. Uh, again, it, it's a tiny minority of the overall Jewish population that can be traced back to the people of Khazar. You can just keep putting them down here. Uh, does Israel have the right of preemptive strike against a nuclear Iran? Okay, let me ask you that question by the raising of your hands. How many of you feel that, first let me phrase it like this, Israel has the right of a preemptive strike. If, if they know that Iran is going to develop nuclear weapons, does Israel have the right to try to take out nuclear reactors? Preemptive strike. How, how many say yes? Okay. All right. How many say no? All right. Great. Thank you. That, that divided pretty evenly, I would think, uh, based, based on those that would be more pro-Israel, more, more pro-Palestinian. Another question. If uh, there was an Arab Palestine and there was a hostile Jewish nation, the Jews had taken over Iran and were developing nuclear bombs and were threatening continually to wipe out the Arab population of Palestine. Would the Arab population of Palestine have the right, would it be a right thing for them to do to do a grand strike to try to stop the evil Jews from developing nuclear bombs? How, how many say yes? How many say no? Okay, a few less no's. Just, just curious. Uh, I, I think this is a debatable question. If for sure they knew that Iran had intent to destroy it, and there's a lot of end time thinking in Iran. Remember, you're, 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 the, the Iranians are Persian, they're Shiite Muslims, the great majority of Muslims worldwide are, are Sunni, the, the Iranians are not Arabs. So, so there, there are those in the Arab Muslim world that are also concerned about Iran getting into your weapons. That's a fact. If for sure it was known that Iran wanted to develop nuclear technology for war. Would it be right to try to take it out with minimum casualties, try to take the reactors out before they'd have nuclear bombs that could wipe out Israel? I think you can make a good case for it. But I understand that there's debate. But I think you make a good case, especially if you're talking about taking out a physical reactor. Hey, much of the Muslim world, the Arab world, was very glad when Israel took out the, the, uh, the Iraqi nuclear plant decades ago because of the potential threat from Saddam Hussein. But that, to me, is a debatable issue. I'm not a hawk, by the way. I, I'm not just kill and attack. That's not my mentality. But I think you can make an excellent case for it. What authority did the United Nations Assembly have to establish a nation on land that did not belong to them? Well, did they have authority to tell anybody anything? Because this was authority that the nations of the world gave them. That's basically what happened. There was war. There was, there was British control after World War I of, of Palestine, and it was a lot of colonialism going on. It was a, different ones extending their various empires, and France wants this, and Britain wants this, and so on. That's a lot of what was going on. And look at a lot of the nations that are nations in the Middle East. They did not exist as nations. The whole, the whole nation of the statehood thing is a war nation. But what authority did the United Nations have? Uh, the authority that was given by, by the nations of the world at that point, and people agreed to it. In other words, if the United Nations had said one, one land only and it's all for Arabs and Jews don't get it at all, that was the authority that they had at that time given to them by those nations of the world. Uh, but to say the land didn't belong to them, in what sense didn't, didn't it belong to Jews? I mean, that would be the question. In what sense did it only belong to, to Arabs who had been living there? Why not Jews who had a continual presence for 3,000 years and who put a tremendous amount of effort and energy into building up the land because that was their national homeland? whereas it had never been a national statehood homeland for the Arabs who were living there. But what is the force behind it that drives Israel to being such a house divided against itself? Ah, why is Israel so critical of Israel? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, 
what, you think American politics is bad. You think American attacks and this politician against that politician is bad. Go to Israel during election times. Yikes. Um, why is it often hostile, critical of itself? Here's the good spin, here's the bad spin. The good spin is that Israelis and Jews are, are, are thinking people and are willing to self-criticize and they love justice and they care about human rights and because of that, they're critical when they believe they're human rights violations against the Palestinians or others. That's the positive spin. And whether it's a spin or not, let's say the positive side. The negative side is that Jews, Jews are stubborn and opinionated. So maybe it's somewhere in, in between the two. But why, it, it, just, just remember that as often as you're criticizing it, it's a country that criticizes itself. Just understand that. Uh, why is America pushing hard for Israel to swap land for peace? Also, is America's current, current administration truly for Israel through their policies? Why is America pushing hard for Israel to swap land for peace? Well, they feel it's the best way to get peace. They feel that a two-state solution is necessary and inevitable. America put tremendous pressure on Israel to get out of Gaza to, to Israel's terrible, painful loss, ultimately. But America would think that's the best way uh, to have peace. America certainly is, is Israel's strongest ally. And yet it's looking at it pragmatically and saying this is what we have to do. And basically thinking that the Israelis are more likely to make concessions. They've given back 91% of land, roughly, that's, that's been taken in battle. More likely to make concessions. But that's their perspective. The current administration, our president has repeatedly said he's a friend of Israel. Many in Israel are skeptical of that. Uh, but it varies. Uh, in other words, uh, George H.W. Bush was absolutely not a good friend of Israel in many, many ways. President Clinton was a much better friend of Israel. Overall, Americans have been friendly towards Israel as recognizing it as a democracy and an ally in the Middle East. Uh, but Israelis were much more positive on former President Bush less President Bush than they are currently on President Obama. Uh, but compared to the rest of the world, Israel and the current administration remain Israel's friend. And by the way, I, I get into all kinds of other things, but I'm not here to bash the current administration or to make that the issue. We've got enough controversy going on in the room. You've got a Jewish follower of Jesus giving a presentation on this. We have enough controversy going on in the room here without opening up some more. Do you believe that Israel should work on dialogue with Iran or should they bomb Iranian nuclear sites? Which method would bring peace? Well, I can guarantee you dialogue won't do it. I can guarantee you dialogue won't do it. Can sanctions do it? Do you just pray and ask for God's protection? Do you take a military option? Those are questions. But for sure, dialogue's not going to do it. There's, there's no dialogue to be had. Uh, when you have Jerusalem Day, ju just look for it. Go to YouTube, something like that, and, and Google it, whatever. And look for Jerusalem Day and watch the crowds multiplied hundreds of thousands burning Israeli flags, thank you, and American flags and, and chanting death to Israel, death to America. Uh, dialogue's not going to do it with, with that mentality. Now, does that speak for all Iranians? Of course not. Of course not. But it does speak for the leadership. Absolutely speaks for the leadership. Uh, can Israel address the problem of the propaganda being taught to... Uh, two three-year-old cartoons on Arab TV for, oh, for children. Okay. Uh, Memory TV, M-E-M-R-I, is an Israeli organization that monitors 24-7 uh, Palestinian TV broadcasts, broadcasts from different parts of the Muslim world, broadcasts from Iran, and then we'll post them and translate them. Uh, there are cartoons, there are there's a famous puppet, kind of like a Mickey Mouse kind of puppet or whatever, whatever the character is, who uh, gets killed by the evil Jews and, and dies on TV for the kids to see. So some real uh, propaganda being taught to little children. Uh, please show me the equivalent of that on Israeli TV. Just please show me the equal of that. Uh, it is a concern. Uh, Palestinian textbooks do not recognize the nation of Israel. Just look at the, the textbooks and the geography. And, and you do have this phenomenon because of Islam that, that being a shaheed, being a martyr, is the one guaranteed way to enter into the, the world to come. 
and with your sins forgiven, etc. Now, traditional Islam, there's a debate. Does it mean a suicide bomber? Some would say no. But certainly dying in, what, in the path of Allah. In other words, if there's a war against some unbelieving nation and, and you died in the field of battle fighting for your Muslim country, then that would be a sure way into paradise. And then the, the 70 virgins and the feasting and all of that. So for sure the idea of being a shaheed, a martyr, fighting against the Jews is of high value in, in, in uh, many Muslim minds. Hence, you can see the presentations, you can watch them, go to the websites of plays with little children singing, you know, in Arabic, that they're going to be shaheeds. Hey, feel free to write down any question. We, we, we asked for someone to dialogue, debate with me, so we just got to be fair, okay? Uh, and, and, and by the way, identify yourself on the question, so if, if I want to go back and forth with the mic, we can do it, okay? Uh, we can't have a debate through note cards. True, but it's not my fault. <laughs> I requested one. I requested someone qualified so it would be fair to the other side. Certainly there must be professors here. There must be activists here. There, there must be students in grad programs. It, it had to be fair. In other words, it's not fair to the side of those differing with me if I have someone who's not a good representative, right? That's not fair. Uh, so that's what I asked for, someone qualified so we could have... Here, uh, please understand this. Yeah, we just got a, a card over here. Sir, do me a favor. Just put a mark on it. So if I want to ask you a follow-up question, I can do that so I know what yours is. So, all right? No, I mean so we can interact. I, I want to open the door to that. Yeah, but, but th the fact of the matter is I have the mic here. I can say whatever in the world I want. My request was can we please have a dialogue or debate so both sides can be represented. I don't know that that's being asked for in the Israeli apartheid. I don't know how many Jewish representatives are asked. Let's have an equal exchange. Let, let's, let's share the floor and do that. That was my request. And that was the constant request of Nair Tamid. And even coming in, Nair Tamid said, we don't want to demonize anyone. We want to do our best to have dialogue. So we, yeah, we can't have a debate through no cards, but then tell the folks that were asked. It's been in the university newspaper making an appeal. Where's the 70 virgins of the Quran? It's not, it's Hadith. It's well-known Hadith. Of course, I mean, that's well-known. Uh, there are UN resolutions targeting Israel, zero targeting Palestine. Why has Israeli government ignored UN resolutions? Uh, first thing, the, the UN Security Council has been famously biased. You just check world, here, what was the UN Security Council outrage after Tiananmen Square? Fuad Ajami, who's, who's a top scholar at Johns Hopkins University, Lebanese scholar, said in the presentation I was at that Israel uses tear gas in this world outrage. Saddam Hussein uses nerve gas and kills his own people. There's no outrage. You know how many atrocities have happened in Syria similar to what's happening now? Where thousands and thousands of Syrian Arabs were slaughtered by the government and not a word from the UN and not a word from the Security Council. And, and UN Resolution 242, by the way, is disputed by both sides in terms of what it, what it actually means. Uh, do you find the size comparison of Israel to the rest of the Arab world somewhat fallacious considering its military might, economic endowment, and overall standard of living? Oh, okay. I didn't read the last question correctly. There are U.S. UN resolutions targeting Israel, zero targeting Palestine. Why has Israel's government ignored UN resolutions? I, I read it correctly. They may not like my answer, but I... Zero targeting Palestine. Oh, oh, 65. 65. That's the proof of what I'm saying. That, this is the perfect, I'm sorry, the 65, I thought it said U.S. Thank, thank you for bringing that to my attention. That's the whole point. How is it possible with all the atrocities that have been committed by extremists, terrorists, Palestinian terrorists against Israel, with its, the first and second intifada, with thousands and thousands and thousands of, of casualties, wounded, murdered, and on and on and on. And the only reason this doesn't happen every single day is because of massive efforts by, by Israeli security to keep murderers out. Your average Palestinian is not a murderer. God forbid you never think that. But there are murderers. The, that, if this is accurate, proves everything I've been saying. Bias, unjust, unequal measures. So do I find the size comparison, but thank you for pointing that out. Do I find the size comparison of Israel to the rest of the Arab world somewhat fallacious, considering its military might, economic endowment, overall standard of living? Of course not. Of course not. 
But when you have 200,000 missiles aimed against you at any given moment, when you have your supposed peace partners calling for your extermination and annihilation, when you have murderers who want to wipe you out 24-7, I know Israeli couples that during times of special, especially difficult conflict, during intifadas and things, Israeli couples would never go out alone together. There would always be one of them with their children. They'd all be together as a family. But if they went out, the husband and wife would never go out alone together. One of them always had to be with the children because they didn't want to risk the kids losing both kids on the same day. This is how they lived for years. This is how they lived for years. This is reality. The kids losing both parents on the same day. So the, the disproportionate weaponry doesn't do you any good when you just go into a mall in Israel, walk into a mall, and you've got to go through security like you get on a flight somewhere. Walk into a mall with a briefcase. Try that out. See how far you get. Sit down in an outdoor cafe without a security being. You think this is something the Israelis enjoy? So no, of course it's not disproportionate. Also, look at the so-called occupied territories and the standard of living before Israeli statehood and before Israeli control, say, in 1967. Look at the standard of living then compared to now. Just look at that and tell me which direction it's gone. What took place on the six-day war between Israel and the other countries? Israel won dramatically in 1967. That's what happened. Some said it was miraculous. Where were the miracles during the Holocaust? Fair questions to ask, but Israel won dramatically. There were strikes being readied by the surrounding nations, and Israel struck and took out almost immediately the Egyptian Air Force, and then from there, it was pretty much all over. If more Israelis accepted Christ as Messiah, do you think the fighting would take a different turn? Well, obviously, I believe if, if you put this anywhere, more Palestinians accepted Jesus as Messiah. More Jews accepted. The world would be a better place if people accepted Jesus as Messiah and truly lived for him as opposed to just being people professing the faith. So everything would be bad. But it still doesn't minimize security issues and things like that. I think everything would be better if that was the case. I'll recommend that. I'll recommend that they do that. In response to the quote, if Israel were to lay down their arms, there would be no, no more Israel if the Palestinians were to lay down their arms in the middle of war. Do you really think it is possible for Palestinians to find power to wipe out Israel? Or could the command of Jesus to turn the other cheek work? Um, the command of Jesus to turn the other cheek in Matthew, the fifth chapter, does not have to do with self-defense. In other words, if someone comes in, a man breaks into your home and attacks your family, Jesus is not saying, you know, for the men, oh, here's my wife, you can rape her. Oh, the kids are down the, the hallway here. Uh, it has nothing to do with self-defense. It has to do with retaliation and, and, and personal vengeance. That's what it has to do with. But in point of fact, if, it, just, just ask this question, all right? And again, thank you for, the, for your patience, for all of you who, who, who <coughs> differ with me. Thank you. Because I've been in this situation many a time, and it's not always easy to sit and you're churning and you want to say stuff and you want everybody to know what, what, what your viewpoint is. So thank you again for, for being patient if you differ. But just a question for you, all right? If Israel had no security fence, did not have its military on guard 24 7, I was in Israel in November of 2010 and, and went into the community of one of my friends. And he was going in through a different entrance. He couldn't get in. The Israeli military stopped him to get into his own community. He was just coming in through a different entrance. And that's just security. It, here is an Israeli. He can't even get in. He had to go to another entrance so, so that he could get in properly. Do you honestly think that there are not large numbers of aggressive and armed Palestinians even if it's the extremists among them, even if it's 10% or whatever numbers, 20%, that would not take advantage of that situation and come in and begin to kill as many Jews as they There's a lot of hostility among some. You can't argue. That. Some feel it's a sacred holy war against the, the, the evil Jews. I, I read the quote from the Palestinian Mufti earlier. Let's, let's hear the renunciation from Palestinian Muslims and Arabs living there about that quote. I'm still eager to hear that. That the resurrection will not come until 
until Muslims rise up and fight against the Jews. If the Palestinians put down their weapons, do you honestly think that if there were suicide bombers in front of white Jewish people, if that threat was not there, do you honestly think that Israel would then march in? I mean, how much are Palestinian arms keeping Israelis from marching in and dominating? That's not happening. It's not happening. If Israel wants to come in and do something right or wrong, it has the power to do it. So the Palestinians say, we're not out to kill you anymore. All right, we all want to wipe you off the map. You don't think you have a better peace partner? This is something to think about. All right, let me, let me keep going, get through as many of these as possible. Why do you still use incorrect term, uh, terminology, Palestinians, Arabs, and Israel, West Bank, Judea, Samaria? And was, why am I using the terms used by those on the other side of the issue? Palestinians, as opposed to Arabs living in the land, and, and West Bank instead of Judea, Samaria, because I'm trying to have a dialogue. And that's how it's commonly done. And if I use the other terms, it would sound unnecessarily fancy. What I'm saying is stirring up enough controversy with enough people already. If I can use terminology that everyone's more at home with, I'm trying to do why do you not mention 76% of East Palestine is Jordan? It just wasn't particularly relevant. Yeah, you could say there's already a Palestinian state it's called Jordan. Maybe 60% of the population is Palestinian. This was not relevant to the larger point I was, I was making. And uh, the Jewish right to the land confirmed in the Quran and Islamic scholars. Uh, I, I would say that there would be a dispute on that, for sure. <laughs> and then uh, you do hear that, that are, uh, well-versed in Quran Islamic scholarship. Certainly it is not the view today of Islamic scholars that Jews have a right to the land. Whatever historical argument there may have been, it's certainly not the case. One, just understand this. Once a, a country or territory is controlled by Muslims, Islam, you, you have Dar Islam and Dar al you, you, you have the, the world of Islam and you have the, the world that you're at war with, the world in conflict. And if, if a territory was once controlled by parts of Spain by Islam and they lost, that's considered a lasting loss. So, so the fact that Jerusalem was fully under Islamic control, and you've got the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque there, the, the, the fact that Islam controlled all of that region for periods of time, now to have others there, especially Jews, that, that is very much looked at as usurped. Uh, yes, land for peace. Israel should retake all its land and demand peace from the Arab occupiers. Paraphrase of Golda Meir. Well, tell you what, why not, why not call it what it is? Something that has absolutely nothing to do with what Golda Meir said. Israel should retake all its land and demand peace from the Arab occupiers. Well, I'm not quite sure what motivated the sentiment, but I certainly don't agree with it, nor would Golda Meir. Do you think that cousins or brothers fight because they have different aunts, mothers, different God. Okay, I don't know exactly the relevance of that question, so sorry if I can't give you a profound answer. So f forgive me if I did not understand the profundity of your question, chalk it up to a lack in my own thinking. But let's just say that family conflicts are deeper. In your own family, you probably talk to each other in ways that you would not talk to people on the outside. Family conflicts can be deeper. A democratic state allows equal access to civic engagement regardless of religion. How can Israel justify being a Jewish majority state and a democracy? Because it does exactly what you said. And it allows equal access to civic engagement regardless of religion. That's what it does. You live in Israel, you're an Israeli citizen, you can be a Muslim, you can be Druze, you can be Baha'i, you can be Christian, you can be Greek Orthodox, Catholic, Protestant, you can be Jewish, you can be atheist, you can be religious Jewish. Yeah, you have. Equal access to civic engagement, of course you do. It happens every day. I mean, Israel boasts about the fact that it protects the rights. Here, if Muslims can worship freely, can they not know the right of the mosque? And, and, if, and if there was disturbance, if there was a Jewish disturbance, I want them to be out, outraged over there. But, but the rights are protected. The rights are protected. Are you against the one state solution? If so, why? Oh, ideally, ideally, it would have been wonderful, just from a biblical Jewish perspective, if there was a Jewish state, a Jewish majority, with Arabs living in there as equal citizens, and you don't need to have an Arab majority because you have all the surrounding countries with, with millions and millions of Arabs and thriving civilizations there. That would have been wonderful 
So you don't have all of the issues of two state. It's not realistic right now. It's not realistic wouldn't be accepted. But ideally, if that had been the case, sure. You've got Muslim nations, you've got Arab nations that are more secular. Um, this would be a Jewish dominated nation where it, Arabs could live as equal citizens, but the fact is they, they do live as equal citizens right now. 1.5 million of them in Israel. If a two-state solution was reached, what would become of the Israeli settlements? That's, that's a point of dispute. That remains an ongoing point of dispute. In, in other words, Israel would still want, just like there are a million and a half Arabs living in, in Israel, Israel would still want Jews living in, in, in what we call uh, the Palestinian state. West Bank and Gaza would still want Jews living. If, if the Arabs could live in the Jewish state, why shouldn't Jews be able to live in the Palestinian state? Simple question. I think it would be fair. Uh, let's see. Please share these facts. 5,300 Palestinians are detained without trial. How can the most democratic country in the Middle East allow this? Where is justice? Yeah, the fact is Israelis are crying out for justice. And there are many, many advocates for Palestinians and what would be considered you know, unfair treatment and things like that. The problem is you've got a lot of terrorists. That's the problem. This is not just indiscriminate attacks on Palestinians. Where it happens, it should be condemned. And Israel is guilty of it, it should be condemned. And the Israelis should be the first to condemn it. Israel is its own worst critic. And just check out these Israeli organizations that are hostile to Israeli policy. Um, but the fact of the matter is, you've got these things going on because you've got a lot of people. Percentage-wise, it's not the bulk of the people. But you've got, what, what's the total population of Palestinians now in the West Bank and Gaza? What's the number? How many million? Three million, four million, more? It's very close to the population of Jews living in Israel. So out of them, you've got a lot of terrorists. If it's 1% if it's that a terrorist bent, that's a lot of terrorists. So there's constant terrorist attacks and there are constant issues going on. And because of that, when you're trying to defend yourself and, and, and you have to arrest people, there may be some arrests that are indiscriminate. The fact of the matter is, Israel is doing its best to bring about justice and where there's wrong being done, it is being investigated. Whereas the same cannot be said on the other side. Please show me where that is the case. Muslims do believe in Jesus as the Messiah, true, but not as the Son of God. So I think it's a great bridge, and, and, and I'm looking forward to that bridge getting fully across where Muslims recognize Jesus as Messiah and Savior. But like I said, we're, we've got enough controversy going on already here. So, but but there, is, there is Muslim reverence and love for Jesus, and he's considered a great prophet. Muhammad, of course, would be the seal of, of prophets in Islam, but his return is awaited as Messiah, but, but not, as, not as Son of God. Do you feel that Arabs are underrepresented in the Knesset? 20% of the Israeli population is Arab, whereas only 10% of the Knesset compromises, comprises of the Arab minority. That's a good question. It's just a voting issue. In other words, nobody's making it happen. It's just voting. It's as parties can organize and vote, then it takes place. I wonder, say, in America here, if you looked at the Hispanic population of America and saw how it was represented, how that would pan out. And is that because of government policies or just ethnic issues and voting and organization and things like that? But the door remains wide open. There's no restriction. No one's stopping it from happening. It's just a matter of parties organizing and, and these things taking place. And please just show me the 1% or the half percent or the one-tenth of 1% one of Jews who are serving in the governments of, of Gaza and Palestinian Republic. Well, 100 percent? Okay, um, it is a silly question if I ask that there could be a possibility that Iran is saying the truth when it comes to using its nuclear facilities for good domestic purposes, as has been said by the Israeli, uh, Iranian leader, or is it all a lie? We don't know for sure. The Iranians know for sure. I would be suspicious. You have a Hitler before World War II, talking about his evil machinations and his plan for Jewish genocide. And a lot of the world did not take him seriously. Now Jews are hearing, this is not that long after the Holocaust. You're, you're talking a little over 60 years after the end of the Holocaust. You still have Israeli Holocaust survivors in Israel and other parts of the world. Now they hear someone publicly calling for the destruction of Israel 
and, 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 and Iran supporting a lot of the terrorism. Hey, can I just say this? In Iraq, where Muslims are killing Muslims, Iran is behind a lot of it. A lot of the unrest, a lot of the terrorism, a lot of the bloodshed. So when they proclaim these things, and they may have an end-time Islamic mentality that they're going to bring on some kind of last great war, there have to be concerns. So are they telling the truth? I doubt it, but it's possible. And I'm sure there are ways for intelligence to find out exactly what's being developed. When you step away from the mic, we can't hear. I thought it was all from here, but I guess they're hearing from here also. When you step away from the mic, we can't hear you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, is that accurate? <laughs> all right. Is this fighting not the continuation of the problem between Sarah and Hagar and the issues between their kids? Uh, here's the deal. I mean, you so you're talking about going all the way back to the book of Genesis and going back 4,000 years. And are there conflicts in the Middle East today? Just a continuation of the conflicts that go back to conflicts with the children of Abraham way back when of Ishmael and Isaac. The problem is there have not always been conflicts. There have not always been problems. There have not always been issues between the two. And you, there, there are pictures, sorry. <laughs> there, there, are, there are pictures you can see in 80 years ago, 100 years ago, there's a founding of a new kibbutz, and the Arab leaders there are, are dedicating the, the, the properties with the Jews. There have been seasons of, of people getting along well together. I simply dispute that it's all the fault of the creation of the state of Israel. I, I say, as we said through the night, that there were extremist elements among the Arab population there that did not want there to be an Israeli state that caused the great conflict. But to this day, there are Jews and Arabs that are trying to work together and, and talk. And by the way, when we're done, just got a few more questions. Those of you that wanted to talk to me, at least we can talk face to face, one on one or 10 on one, whatever, but I'll stick around for a few minutes. But if you could be kind enough, when we're done, uh, and Stephanie gives whatever closing words or directions or anything like that, uh, if you could be kind enough, those that differ with me that would like to talk to me directly, if, if you agree with me, if you could wait, so those who differ with me could talk to me first. Is that fair? Okay. Uh, in the last 40 years, there have been international proposals for Mideast peace, such as the Oslo Accords. Additionally, every American administration since Nixon has involved himself in seeking peace there. Can this ever succeed? Uh, I'm hopeful but skeptical. That's why I bring in my religious and spiritual beliefs and I pray for the Lord's return. We have to do whatever we can for reconciliation and peace and there's no reason for people living as neighbors to, to be hostile towards each other or wanting the elimination of the other party or whatever it is, or the oppression of any party. Uh, I am hopeful but skeptical. Uh, I will not read biblical prophecy into things to say that I know for a fact it cannot happen. But the lasting peace that we really look for, I don't believe will happen before Jesus returns. However, we can have steps in the right direction. And what if it's a century before he comes back, or two centuries rather than five years? Then we have to do what we can in, in the here and now. Why can't we have dialogue now? You know, here, here's the other, sorry, sorry. Uh, here, here's the other issue about having dialogue now. First, fairness. When, when Nair Tamid works hard, goes to different organizations on campus and asks for dialogue, asks for someone to, to share the platform with me. Again, why do I want to do that? Because I like to debate. Well, I do like to debate, but that's, that's, not, that's not the issue. I'm not here to win a debate, okay? I love to debate because you get to put both sides on the table and, and you can hear your champion and the other person hears their champion. And then you can often see who's, who's twisting something, who's not accurate, who doesn't have good backing for things. So that was my, my desire from the start when it was proposed to me was please let's do our best to have public dialogue debate. And, and that's what I do constantly with those who differ with me. Call into my radio show if you don't believe me. I love doing that. And I learn from it too. And if I'm challenged on something, I'm going to go look, look into it even more. And maybe I can challenge the other person. And that was near Tom Eads heart as well. So when, when we try that, and then they take out a full page ad and run it for the entire week in the newspaper. And, and we went over the wording together very carefully to say that we believe the gracious and mutually respectful interchange of ideas can only be helpful. Yes, this mic is on. Uh, 
at this point now, for someone to then say, okay, I'd like to dialogue, or we're gonna go back and forth, it can turn into a shouting match, but it can also be that you're not the best representative for your position, and it embarrasses a position, or I now refute it and it looks so good, so it, it's, it's just not fair, it's not ethical, it's not right. However, like I said, those that differ with me, I'd love to talk to you one-on-one, -on -one. and my radio program, which goes nationally, instead of just having a voice here, have it all over. Okay, I think this is the last question, is no one in this room would like to demonize Israel or Palestine, as that prevents dialogue, but can you speak to the correlation between the PLO's corrupt $12 billion budget, Israel's IDF budget alone is $53 billion in 2010? Uh, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100% sure what this question means, but let's just say if this is accurate, if Israel's spending $53 billion on defense, the IDF in 2010, that's not its desire. It doesn't want to do that any more than we'd like to spend a disproportionate num uh, amount of money on our defense. Uh, I, what I want to encourage you to do is, is this. This presentation is audio taped and, and videotaped, so we'll, we'll make it available. Uh, our goal was whatever we do that people could look at afterwards, and, and you have the actual quotes and so on. I referenced a couple of times the book by Ephraim Karsh, K-A-R-S-H, He's a top Middle East scholar based in uh, London, I believe. Palestine Betrayed, it, it's massively documented with original sources. Uh, I encourage you to look at it carefully. He's also very familiar with what are called the new historians in, in, in Israel and their literature. So take a look at that as, as an excellent resource. We all have our websites that, that sensationalize things both ways. And then the best thing, the best thing is sit down over lunch, over a meal, or at somebody's room or home, and have a meal together and say, tell me your story. Please tell me your story. When I meet people that strongly differ with me on social issues, ideological issues, spiritual issues, especially if they have a story of, of being oppressed or persecuted or something, that's always my question. Please tell me your story. Sit down and hear from each other. Just having our Palestinian Puerto Rican Presentation, I, I, that's how you identified, Palestinian mom, Puerto Rican dad, or did I have it backwards? Okay, Palestinian dad, Puerto Rican mom. Uh, when, when she asked if she could read a poem, well, of, of course. It, it was one person that came forward, and I thought that right from the start, it gives things a human element and an appeal to look past the differences. So I've laid things out as clearly as I can to present the truth and things that I'm concerned will not be heard during the so-called apartheid week. But sit down and talk, especially those that differ. Make opportunities to sit down and talk. Tell each other your stories. If I have a blind spot, I want to see it. If you have a blind spot, I want to help you see it. And truth and light will triumph in the end. Can we agree to that? All right, Stephanie, thanks so much for your attention. I appreciate it.